Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we'll take our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Dr. Irons, let's uh, let's break it down. What are we looking at in terms of cases and overall trends for COVID-19 this week? Well, we're starting to see numbers go up. Um, we're at, an, you know, some people are calling it an inflection point um, and not quite sure why, but Current numbers today are 31,198,546 cases and 562,067 deaths. Overall, as I said, we're seeing COVID cases and hospitalizations on the rise. Um, at least 700 new COVID uh, deaths and 64,285 new cases were reported in the United States on Saturday. Over the past week, there's been an average of just shy of 68,000 cases per day, an increase of 11% from the average two weeks earlier. And a number that, you know, as we've said before, is still way too high. Um, hospitalizations are also starting to follow that trend, up 7.3% over the previous week, but thankfully deaths have continued to decrease. Um, case numbers nationally are lar largely stagnant, but there's a high variability from state to state. Infection levels remain low in most of the West and the South, but are increasing rapidly in parts of the Midwest and the East. Let's talk about that, because I think, you know, what we're seeing here in terms of trends is it's pretty astounding because we're seeing up to, you know, uh, not quite a half of all these new cases coming from uh, just a handful of states. Uh, what are you seeing there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins University reported last week, as you said, that just five states have accounted for about 43% of new cases over the last week. Those include New York, Michigan, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Um, those states are home to 22% of the U.S. population. Um, and But in addition to that, nearly half of the states are seeing a rise in new cases. Michigan um, continues to be um, the hardest hit, the worst in America, with more than 7,000 new cases daily. But with residents weary of restrictions, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has avoided calling for another lockdown as, and is instead appealing to personal responsibility. The Michigan governor's position not to lock down represents a larger shift we're starting to see in the politics of the pandemic, which is increasingly being shaped by growing public impatience and the hope that's offered by vaccines. Boy, that's a, it's a tough situation and hope that, uh, you know, we don't see those kinds of increases um, because obviously the virus doesn't respect state lines. So, you know, what so, other kinds of uh, drivers are we seeing right now? Well, you know, I, once again, it's, it's, a, it's a race between uh, the variants and the vaccinations. You know, a lot of this is really about the variants right now. The UK B117 variant is now the dominant strain in the US. We know that this variant is driving many of the cases we're seeing in Michigan. As we've discussed previously, experts say the variant is more contagious, may cause more severe disease, and is also potentially more deadly. Um, we're also seeing that US hospitals are admitting more young adults in their 30s and 40s with severe COVID COVID symptoms. Um, so again, this is thought to be a direct result of variants and also the fact that um, we have still not vaccinated a, you know, enough of the population um, to begin to make a, a huge, a huge difference here. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the race. The vaccination uh, acceleration has been dramatic. I remember when we were talking, uh, you know, a couple of months ago saying, hey, we need to get over a million vaccinations a day that 3 million was going to be this number that was going to be kind of like a dramatic milestone. But lo and behold, new record, 4.6 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines in one day. That's huge. It is huge. Um, you know, the 4.6 million doses on Saturday is more than 500,000 higher than the old record last Saturday. Um, so it really reflects the increasing pace. And I think if we just talk to people in the community, um, we're beginning to see that. Um, the CDC also said on Saturday about 117.1 million people have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. That's about um, a, a half of U.S. adults and about 70.7 
7 million people have been fully vaccinated um, by either the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine or the two-dose series made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. So we're getting there. Um, you know, this all comes as last Tuesday, President Biden moved up his deadline by two weeks to April 19th for states to make every American adult eligible for coronavirus vaccination. This announcement actually follows the lead of states around the country that were already meeting that timetable. And in other vaccine news, Pfizer and BioNTech has requested the FDA's approval to use their vaccine in 12 to 15 year olds. Um, we still don't know the date um, of, of when that's going to be reviewed, but we'll continue to watch that. Gosh, I remember when it was just kind of 10 or 12 million people having gotten vaccines. So we are really seeing uh, those numbers increase. Um, do you think the road or the obstacle we just ran into, at least for J&J, uh, you know, is having some real uh, problems on the production side is going to hamper those efforts? Well, I think it'll hamper efforts to con to to actually scale up more. Um, you know, J&J &J has hit some stumbling blocks in production because of this. Supplies of its one-dose vaccine will plunge next week. We're seeing reports of deliveries set to fall by 86%. And, you know, that's a single-dose one-in-one vaccine. Um, so it, that is certainly going to impact future numbers. Um, the main reason, as the White House Pandemic Response Coordinator explained on Friday, is that federal regulators will need to approve production at a Baltimore manufacturing plant um, that's had some concerns. Um, federal officials also said that Materna, Moderna and Pfizer, Bio, Pfizer BioNTech could make up some of the shortfall. And they've also pointed out that some states are not currently using all the vaccine allocated to them. So we'll, ha we'll have to see what this does to the numbers, but certainly a bit of a setback. Well, you know, and a lot of countries uh, around the world have kind of made, you know, bigger bets on the AstraZeneca vaccine and, you know, continuing to be a complicated story there. Do you want to uh, break that down as well? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, you know, there, there's there been some new research that has identified unusual antibodies that appear to have caused, in very rare cases, serious and sometimes fatal blood clots in people who received the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, this uh, the, this research has was published in um, uh, in the April 9th edition of the New England Journal. Two papers, one from Germany and one from uh, one from Norway, um, found that people who developed the clots after vaccination had produced antibodies that activated their platelets, a blood component involved in clotting. Um, it, the, the clinical uh, syndrome looked a lot like immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, um, and that's what Germany called it. The report from Norway indicated the condition is similar to autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, it's, um, you know, there have been um, not, not thankfully not many patients, so the data is still being collected. Um, it's unsure why this is happening. Younger people appear to be more susceptible than older ones, um, but researchers say no pre-existing health conditions are known to predispose people. So what we've seen is that some countries are actually shifting um, uh, shifting the population age that can get this max vaccine. Um, but while the vaccine hasn't been authorized for use in the United States, um, you know, this has been a crushing blow to global efforts to halt the pandemic because the, the AstraZeneca shot, which is easy to store and relatively cheap, has been a mainstay of vaccination programs in more than 100 countries. Well, uh, that is tough news. Um, another update that came out uh, last week was from the CDC, and it was reminiscent. We passed by a grocery store yesterday with my family and were reminiscing about you know, wiping down all those groceries that we got just only a year ago. But the CDC is coming back now and saying uh, it's kind of the end of what they called, quote, hygiene theater. What is that? <laughs> So late last week, the CDC updated its guidelines on the dangers of coronavirus infection from touching um, uh, surfaces that might have droplets, a doorknob, a subway pole, or another surface. And what they noted was that the risk is extremely low. Um, you know, driving this thinking was the belief that the vaccine was spread primarily through large respiratory droplets that could theoretically fall into surfaces, and then you pick them up by touch and pass them on to mucous membranes in the nose or the eyes. 
Um, as we all remember, this led to this frenzy nicknamed hygiene theater where we saw people, you know, stocking up on Clorox wipes and, and companies and schools closing regularly for deep cleanings. Um, what we learned over the past year is that the virus spreads almost entirely through the air. And experts now say that it's while it's theoretically possible to catch the virus from a surface, it requires something of a perfect storm. Lots of recently deposited virus particles on a surface that are then quickly transferred to someone's hand and then to the face. Well, I was a, a germaphobe even before the pandemic began and tried not to touch anything, but this does make me feel better. And sorry to the people at uh, Clorox uh, for this news, but good for the rest of us, but just you know, make sure to keep washing those hands. Um, you know, in terms of those disinfectants, are we released from this? Uh, or is there other guidelines in terms of, you know, keeping things clean? Yeah, so they, the updated guidelines say that chemical disinfectants are not needed to keep service transmission low, just hand washing, mask wearing, and in most cases, cleaning surfaces with regular soap and water. So yes, physicians still need to tell their patients to wash their hands, no confusion about that, but it's the elaborate deep cleanings that have become commonplace that are not doing so much to eliminate spread. You know, these deep cleanings have led to closed playgrounds, taking nets off basketball courts, quarantining books in the library, and what we're learning is that we don't have to be taking those measures. Um, and, you know, it's worth noting this is what scientists have been saying for months, um, but, you know, common sense and soap and water um, are, are important. I was unaware of the taking off of the nets in basketball <laughs> courts. That does seem uh, a bit extreme. People yeah. need to just know that, uh, you know, wearing masks, keeping your distance, washing your hands and get that vaccine when you can. That's the key here. Um, any other messages from AMA that you'd like to share this week? Well, three messages. It's been a busy week um, on April 7th as new COVID cases were peaking in the U.S. in late 2020. Most physicians reported that health plans continue to impose bureaucratic prior authorization policies that delay, ac that delay access to necessary care and sometimes result in serious harm to patients. According to new survey results issued last Wednesday by the AMA, nearly one third, 30 percent of physicians reported that prior authorization requirements have led to a serious adverse event for a patient in their care, according to the survey. Um, and the findings in the survey illustrate a critical need to streamline or eliminate low value prior authorization requirements to minimize delays or disruptions in care delivery. On April 8th, the AMA applauded the Biden administration's executive actions to curb gun violence. This includes requiring background checks for ghost guns. We urge a rapid rulemaking process to stop the proliferation of these dangerous weapons. Um, the AMA also supports red flag laws, allowing family members, intimate partners, household members, and law enforcement personnel to petition a court for the removal of a firearm when there is high or imminent risk for violence. But these actions are just a first step. And then finally, on April 8th, the AMA applauded the CDC for recognizing racism as a, as a public threat. Um, a quote from that statement, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disproportionately plague black and brown communities, it's clear that collective action from all stakeholders is needed to dismantle systemic racism and confront, embed, and advance equity across our healthcare system. The AMA applauds the CDC for formally recognizing racism as a public health threat and elevating and sharing the work of the AMA through its new racism and health initiative. That is uh, that is a very strong statement and consistent with policy coming out of the AMA uh, last year that recognized racism as a public health threat. So uh, applauding the CDC for uh, their stand as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Irons, for being here today. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.